very excited that you're here. It's an honor for me. I'm Mary Zahm, Professor of Psychology and Director of Civic Engagement here at BCC. Some of you might be in my online classes. You can introduce yourself because I wouldn't know what you look like. Um, it's an honor, a real honor for me to introduce Dr. Bernice Lott. She was one of my professors in graduate school and is a valued mentor and friend. I was introduced to feminist research in her class on hostility and violence in the lives of women in a big way and continued my education by reading her book, Becoming a Woman. Dr. Lott is Professor Emerita of Psychology and Women's Studies at the University of Rhode Island and is former dean of the University College. She has also taught at the University of Colorado and Kentucky State College and was a visiting scholar, professor at Brown University Center for Research and Teaching on Women, Stanford University's Institute for Research on Women and Gender, the Department of Psychology in Waikato University, New Zealand, and University of Hawaii in Manoa. She's been around. Bernice Lott received her university's excellent award for scholarly achievement, served as president of the American Psychological Association's Division on the Psychology of Women, and has been honored for scholarly teaching, mentoring, and social policy contributions by APA's Committee on Women, the Association for Women in Psychology, the National Multicultural Conference and Summit, and the New England Psychological Association. In 1999, the University of Rhode Island awarded her the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. She's the author of numerous theoretical and empirical articles, chapters, and books in the areas of social learning, gender, poverty, and other social issues. Her areas of interest are interpersonal discrimination, the intersection among gender, ethnicity, and social class, multicultural issues, the social psychology of poverty, and the social psychology of dissent. Dr. Lott served on APA's Council of Representatives on the Coalition of Division for Social Justice. She's a member of the Interdivisional Minority Pipeline Project working on strategies to increase the recruitment and retention of graduate students of color. A 2007 book co-authored with Heather Bullock, a former student of Bernice's, on economic injustice was honored by the National Library Association and the Association for Women in Psychology. Her newest book, Multiculturalism and Diversity, a Social Psychological Perspective, published in 2010, focuses on the ways in which history and identity inform each other and examines the politics of culture as well as the politics of cultural identities within the United States. Last week, Dr. Bernice Lott was awarded the American Psychological Foundation 2011 Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement in Psychology in the Public Interest. Only one psychologist is awarded this every year, so this is a really big deal. It's a huge recognition for her scholarship and her tireless efforts to bring about the most significant social changes from the civil rights movement forward, including pioneering work in the psychology of women and her recent success convincing APA to appoint a permanent committee addressing the issues of social class. Congratulations, Bernice, very well deserved. Please welcome Dr. Bernice Lott, who will discuss some of the enduring inequalities that women face in our society today and the place of gender within the multicultural mosaic. I'm tired already. <laughs> A lot of stuff there. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it was worth that great drive up from, from Kingston. Uh, my topic is gender inequality. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to sort of weave my way around that rather than take a direct path. 
but I think you're going to be able to follow uh, everything, and I'm hoping that there will be a lot of questions and a lot of a lot of discussion. Let me tell you a little bit something more about myself that was not part of the professional bio. Uh, like uh, like all of you, uh, I did my college undergraduate and even later my graduate work at a public public college and university. Uh, I was always a commuter. <laughs> Uh, like many of you, or some of you at any rate, sitting in this room, uh, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother. <laughs> and uh, again, like some of you, not all, but some of you probably sitting in this room, uh, I'm the daughter of uh, immigrants. So I think we have a lot in common, and even though you're sitting up there, it's going to be fine. Um, I'm not too accustomed to the mic. I, let me start, let me start uh, dealing with the issue of gender equality by reading something to you and tell me uh, if you've heard it before and in what it is and in what context. Here's what I'm reading. <clears throat> equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. What is that? Ever hear of it before? Ever hear those words before? Huh? Anybody? Just speak up. Other than Mary. <laughs> the the Nineteenth Amendment? No, but you're you're warm. It's not the Nineteenth Amendment. It is not part of the United States Constitution. Anybody know what it is? Okay, then I'm glad I brought it with me. It is called the Equal Rights Amendment. It is part of the Canadian Constitution, but it is not part of the US Constitution, despite the fact that it has been introduced into Congress every single, the beginning of every single uh, uh, Congress, uh, beginning in 1923, when it was uh, written by a woman named uh, Alice Paul, uh, who was a leader of the suffragist movement in the United States, and she founded something called the National Women's, uh, National Women's Party, not National Women's Rights Party, but the National Women's Party, Alice Paul, 1923, remember that, and every year it has been introduced into the Congress of the United States, and it has not yet, not yet, what is this, uh, 2011, not yet been introduced. It came very close. Uh, in 1972, it was actually 1972, the good old 70s, before some of you were born, uh, it came very close, it was actually passed by Congress. But then what happens with an amendment to the Constitution, as some of you know from your history and poli sci classes, it has to go out to the states. And so it went out to the states, and it never yet has come close to the 38 states that are required for it to pass. So that's the beginning to gender inequality in the United States. Okay. Now, I want to go from that, which I want you to keep, keep in mind, uh, to, to uh, the words of, um, uh, to the words of a woman by the name of, um, of Laura Schlesinger, who some of you may have heard of. She's a conservative talk show host, and people call, a, call in with problems about relationships and she answers them. And in 2008, uh, she said the following to a caller, or in response to some problem that a caller had raised. She said, Laura Schlesinger said, I hold accountable for tossing out perfectly good men by, I hold women, I'm sorry, I'll start again. I hold women accountable for tossing out perfectly good men by not treating them with the love and kindness and respect and attention that they need. That was her advice to her women, uh, to a woman who, who, who called it. 
Now, the reason I, I, I bring these words up, especially after the Equal Rights Amendment, is because, to me, uh, these words illustrate the lasting strength, even in this 21st century, of powerful expectations for relationships between women and men. Regardless of a woman's personal achievements or situation, her obligation to stand by her man retains its pres prescriptive dominance. During the past few decades in the United States, we have witnessed a number of wives of prominent men in important political positions facing television cameras as they are humiliated by the public apologies and explanations of their husbands for serious misdeeds involving sexual behavior, lies, and sometimes even illegal acts. <clears throat> We witnessed this with Hillary Rodham Clinton as she stood by her husband, then President Clinton, during public reports of a relationship with a young White House intern. Similarly, a woman by the name of Silda Wall Spitzer from New York stood by the side of her husband, Elliot Spitzer, who was then governor of New York, as he publicly acknowledged improprieties. Ms. Spitzer, a Harvard Law School graduate, had put her promising law career on hold at the birth of the first of their three children to assist her husband in his career and to care for the children. Governor Spitzer, a former attorney general and anti-prostitution crusader admitted publicly to being a client of what was described as an international prostitution ring and transporting a female sex worker across state lines in violation of federal law. Former Governor Spitzer is now co-host of a CNN uh, talk show. Any questions at this point? Huh? Sounds about right. Yeah. Well, there he is. He's. I don't know. I don't know where Miss Spitzer is right now. She's kept a low profile, but <clears throat> she she stood by her side like uh, like uh, Hillary Clinton did. Anybody? Questions? Comments? Before I go on. I'm going to do this periodically, so get ready to talk. OK, I'll go on. At this point, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, into our discussion some social psychological concepts. First, the term sexual identification. Sexual identification at birth, when people say it's a boy, it's a girl, appears to be universal across the globe. This recognition of a baby's sexual category is followed immediately and throughout life by the continuing development of what we call gender. Gender is defined by socially constructed prescriptions, that is, things to do, and proscriptions, that is, things not to do with respect to behavior, expectations, and environments. The differential behaviors that all of us learn as appropriate for, our, for us, girls, women, boys, men, <clears throat> in a given society and a given historical period constitute the roles identified with our sex. Because these behaviors are, for the most part, unrelated to the few reliable biological imperatives or biological distinctions between the sexes, we use the word gender to refer to these human groups. Whereas the terms female and male refer to sexual distinctions across all animal species, apes, dogs, cats, 
the terms woman and man are specific to human beings and denote gender. That is, the learned attributions about characteristics, the learned prescriptions for performance of what is appropriate, appropriate behavior. So from the beginning of our lives, we learn what is expected of us as girls, women, or boys, men, and to watch and emulate other persons who are most like us. We learn to repeat actions for which we are rewarded or praised, and to avoid those for which we are criticized or punished. Makes sense, right? We also learn which environments are considered most suitable for us and most available to us. That's really a pretty big thing. Consider, for example, the typical preschool play areas of trucks and dress up and where we are most likely to see girls and boys. Okay, question time. Yes. especially being a feminist male. Um, for example, my son, I try to be neutral uh, and not uh, impose roles on him and, and make him accountable when he falls into that sort of societal place where he, he feels mm -hmm. he should be. And yeah. he, he's, not, he's just allowed to be him. Well, thank you. Good comment. Remember, it's not just parents. <laughs> It's parents, it's uh, media, it's the institutions, it's the Constitution of the United States, it's, uh, it's everything, but that's good. So you have a son, uh, I have a son, and uh, I'll never forget this, this is you know indelible in my head. When uh, he was uh, very young, he was in a, I think a second and third grade combo in uh, South Road School in, uh, where I live in, uh, in, in uh, South County. And uh, he was a good kid, nice kid. And I remember, uh, and his teacher liked him and he did very well. And I remember one day having a little conference uh, with his teacher who said, who said something, paraphrasing, said something like, dude, Josh, is, he, he's a really nice kid, but let's, let's watch him because he's not, a real, he's, not real, he's not a real boy. He's not a real boy. Well, we all know what she meant with that. No, he, he wasn't getting into fights. He was reasonable. <laughs> he was doing his stuff. Uh, I can assure you he's a real man. <laughs> he's now the father of three boys, actually. But uh, yeah, so you get it from everywhere. And she was a nice teacher. She was not, she didn't mean any harm. She was just helping me to understand that, you know, maybe I should keep my eyes on it. Maybe he should get into more stuff on the playground with uh, with other kids, which he I don't think he ever did. I don't think he ever had much. I don't think he ever had a fight <laughs> that I know about. <laughs> Maybe he did. All right, so let's go on. Any other comment? Thank you for that. Uh, especially implicated in the ways in which girls and boys and women and men relate to one another is relative power, right? <laughs> or access to resources. The rest of it wouldn't matter too much if the power was the same, but of course it's not. The power difference between the genders is influenced by the context, of course, the time, the place, and by other cultural characteristics or categories um, of the people engaged in interaction with one another, especially ethnicity, social class, sexual identity, and maybe some others, but those are the main key other factors other than gender that interact with gender when people are interacting with one another uh, and uh, there's, we're looking at power. 
Nevertheless, <clears throat> even though there are all these other social categories that are important, women's lesser social status relative to men's remains a ubiquitous feature of our, and I'm just talking about US now, of our society, where for the most part, institutions are so organized that men are economically, politically, and often interpersonally dominant. Women's disadvantaged position in the United States economy relative to men's in hiring, wages, and benefits is well known and amply documented. A recent phenomenon is illustrative. One writer notes that in the first, our first decade, well now we're almost, we're in the second really, but in the first decade of the 21st century, the percentage of women employed outside the home is dropping. The economy hasn't been so good for anybody, but it's been a little bit worse <clears throat> for employed women. Currently, there are um, the, percentage of women in the workforce is 61% currently. Uh, women over 21 working outside the home. Data from, a, excuse me, loud. Data from a congressional study suggests that women are dropping out of the workforce not because they have chosen to stay at home with their children, but because of layoffs, stagnant wage, wages, and discouraging job prospects. I know that's bad to say in front of students, but unfortunately, it's the reality. The pattern seems similar among well-educated and less educated women, among married and never married women, among white women and minorities of color, same, same pattern, right now in this economy. While the past few decades have witnessed great changes within gender cultures, there's no denying that, it is still the case that women and men are often excluded from what is considered to be the domain of the other. For women, this translates into more limited access to resources. It translates into fewer positions of high status. It translates into narrower opportunities for personal growth and development. Women's continued relative absence from high-level decision-making positions and lesser probability of economic affluence <clears throat> illustrate the sexism that remains an overt and covert, <coughs> excuse me, feature of US society. Today, women constitute, <clears throat> you won't believe this, 16.8% of Congress. 16.8% of Congress. Even as I read it, I have to sort of like uh, pinch myself. Of the 90 women in today's Congress, which is down from 93 in the last Congress, 17 are in the Senate and 73 are in the House. The United States is tied with Turkmenistan, for 73rd place in the world for women legislators. That's something to remember. <laughs> 73rd, not first, second, third, or 13th, or even 33rd, but 73rd tied with Turkmenistan, which is a very small, tiny place, I think. In state, legislators, in state legislatures, women are 24. 0.3% in the legislature, and in uh, gov executive positions, governor and lieutenant governor, women are 22.9%. We do, of course, finally, have three women in the Supreme Court, 
It took a long time. That's, that's incredible. But among top companies in the United States, like the Fortune 500, 3% are CEOs. 15% are board members. Questions? The time for questions or comments? Comments are definitely. Yeah, I got a hypothetical question. Yeah. Um, if there were more women in charge of the, uh, the banking industry, do you think we would have had the financial strike that we have now? Absolutely, yes. Women are subject. <laughs> we all live in the same capitalist economy. Yeah. Do, uh, would you think that they'd be a little more honesty because they have something to prove? Why, why are women more honest than men? Well, they have to make a, they have to, they have to strike more than, than men do, so they would be more apt to uh, be more diligent and go out. Some women uh, are, and some women are not. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> some men are, and some men are not. I don't think that there's anything in the nature of being a woman or being a man that is tied to any of these wonderful characteristics. It would be nice. But it's not necessarily the case. In your opinion, Bernice, why do people in general focus on these forms in terms of identity, the labels, you know, the masculine, the feminine, the man, woman? What, what is, is this just? Well, it, <coughs> it's, it's to make sure that we learn what we're supposed to learn. You want to, you're a man, you want to be masculine, and what you know all of that entails. Uh, you're a woman, you want to be feminine, and all that that entails. We buy into it. it, it well, yeah, we do. So how do we change that? <laughs> we talk, <clears throat> we think, we act, we do. You know, if we we act on our on our knowledge and our beliefs, and uh, it depends upon what you want to change. I mean, each of us is a social change uh, actor. It depends upon your values and where you want to go. Some people are content with the status quo, and unfortunately, they have uh, a lot of resources to help maintain that. Yes? You said that women were dropping out of the workforce. 61%. What were the reasons that why do you think they're doing that? I can't hear. What were the reasons for it, for women dropping out of the workforce, and why do you think that? Oh, for dropping down? Yeah. It's a tough economy. And uh, women, especially uh, low-paid women, uh, are easily let go. Uh, and, uh, it's a tough economy for men, too. I was just making the point that the data suggests that when it's a tough economy, women are hurt first. Not that it's not a tough economy for anybody, everybody, but because of the differential. Do you think some of that was last in and first out as far as seniority goes? Well, I don't know. I, 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 can't, I don't want to talk about seniority because, <clears throat> but partially that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see a trend in academia um, heading towards either masculine studies or uh, that incorporate the queer theory, everybody, um, or we still sort of... <laughs> That's interesting. We can talk a lot, a lot about queer theory. <clears throat> well, there's some schools in which uh, uh, there are courses on gender studies, queer studies, so it depends, you know, there's a lot of differences among, among schools, but if it's something that you think you want in your school, you have to ask for it. <laughs> well, <clears throat> way, way back in 1971 or two or three, uh, no, I guess it was 1970, uh, I was new to the University of Rhode Island, and I had never taught a course on women. Uh, I was a s traditional social psychologist, <clears throat> and I was in my office, which at that time in 1970 was um, a Quonset hut <laughs> <laughs> at, at, uh, on the campus in Kingston, 
And I was in my office and all of a sudden a group of young women came and knocked on my door with a, a faculty member from art history. No, she wasn't with them. No, they came knocked on my door and they said, <clears throat> uh, we want you to teach a course on women. <laughs> what? <laughs> they demanded it. I, I didn't know these women students. I don't know why they grabbed me or what they'd heard about me. But they came in and they convinced me. And we, we didn't have a course on women. So I developed a course called The, F the Female Experience, uh, which I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't have called that course that now. I wouldn't have called it that now, but that's what I called it, The Female Experience. And it became an experimental course in the psychology department. I had no uh, curriculum. I had to make it up out of, you know, whatever. There were no textbooks. There was one uh, rather poor book that had been written on <clears throat> women's experiences, which I started out with. And then, of course, as I started teaching and engaging with my students, um, I decided I would write a book. And I read it. <laughs> she read it. And that, that was the, my, first, my first book on women. It was called, uh, what was that one called? Becoming a Woman. Be Becoming a woman. I still yeah. So anyway, students matter. Of course, you need a little help from your faculty. But students matter. If there's something you think you need, uh, go for it. <laughs> it. Can't hurt. Yeah. You touched upon politics briefly, um, without necessarily getting into political views. Do you think Sarah Palin has the um, the qualities and character that you would want representing you? As um, you know, she seems to be one of the more high-profile women, and she was kind of well. I personally. I think it's not a question of her character <clears throat> or anything. I think it's a question of her political values. And I don't have her political values. I have a different set of political values. So it does come down to a lot. In other words, Sarah Palin is a lot of things. And actually, I'm going to mention her in a minute. <laughs> but uh, no, politically, I, I would not want her to represent me. Why do you think she was vaulted to the forefront of the political scene? And maybe there might be other women that might be more qualified. Well, I, my vote takes into account a lot of things, a lot of things, uh, uh, gender being only one of them. Takes in a lot of things having to do with social and political values on how people feel uh, about human rights, about how people feel about civil rights, about how people feel about um, immigration, about how people feel about uh, reproductive rights. See, there's a whole bunch of stuff about how people feel about um, um, same-sex marriage. See, so it's more than just gender, although gender, obviously, as we're saying, is a big, big deal. Yeah, I only asked this. Uh, Sarah Palin and I, let's put it that way, share a lot because we're women. But we disagree also on a lot because of other uh, other factors that we have to take into consideration. But as women, yeah? It kind of seems to me like she was almost typecast a little bit. Mm-hmm. And part of it she did herself, as I'll say in a minute. <laughs> Actually, I'm kind of getting into Sarah Palin. <clears throat> I have one question. Oh, yes, please. You mean who are running for office? Yeah, and public figures that they get real more, more you know, mud slinging on the women and they get targeted more than the men. Yeah, I think it's harder to I see it. hard, harder to make it in the general, you know, arena if you're a woman because of what we expect women to do and be and be like, just like you expect women to be nice. <laughs> it's part of the same thing. Yeah. You want them to be a little nicer, a little bit more honest, and, yeah. And those are our expectations, All right? So yeah, so it's come down heavier, much heavier than a woman. Yes. Geraldine Ferraro, who just passed away. She just she died. The first woman running for vice president. Yes. I think she was more 
I don't want to say they were tortured by the, by the press. She was. <coughs> yeah. I remember seeing her here in Providence when she was, uh, there was a big meeting somewhere, downtown Providence, not here, but Providence up there, down there. Uh, I remember, so I went and, and I went and heard her. She's very impressive. Hi. Okay. Thank you for your questions and comments. That's really, really helps me. Helps me know where we're at together. Okay. So let me move on. Despite great societal changes in the past several decades, and this gets to what we've been talking about, expectations are still not the same for women and men, and significant consequences, this is what we're talking about like the media, significant consequences to the individual follow from both conformity, if you conform to the expectations, and deviation. Gender still organizes social life and much of individual experience. And here you see I'm right with you all. In 2008, former First Lady Senator Clinton, who we all know is now our Secretary of State, and by the way was gung-ho for sending uh, planes over Libya, another story, right? <laughs> Keep that in mind. Anyway, uh, in 2008, when Hillary Clinton was uh, <clears throat> seeking, seeking the nomination of the Democratic Party for President of the United States, she was the target. See, we're all together on this. I can't, so nice that you've preceded me. She was the target of demeaning misogynist humor and many taunts. Uh, these can be sadly illustrated by the words of two TV, uh, two cable TV commentators. Chris Matthews, known as a liberal, called Senator Clinton a she-devil. You may, some of you may remember that. And Tucker Carlson, known as a conservative, said that he involuntarily crosses his legs when she comes on television. Uh, the first one, Chris Matthews, uh, Tucker Carlson. Tucker? Tucker Carlson. Uh, I think he's been on Fox. Sarah Palin, getting to Sarah now, has described herself. She describes herself as a former beauty queen, as a hockey mom, and a member of the PTA. Now, we all know why she does that, right? <laughs> even though we also know that she hunts and fishes and stuff. <clears throat> but she describes herself as a former beauty queen, a hockey mom, and a member of the PTA, because that's what she's supposed to be, while describing her husband as a steel worker and a snowmobile racer, because that's what he's supposed to do. So those are just examples. Our, what I'm giving are examples of what I call our gender culture. Our gender culture can be identified and described by how we dress, what we're expected to like and dislike, what vocations are considered most suitable for us, what behaviors are expected of us, what knowledge we are assumed to have, what skills we are supposed to possess, it's still not the norm to see a man sewing missing buttons on his shirt, although I'm, I think some of you may be able to do that. <laughs> not hard, but it's still not the norm. <clears throat> it's still not the norm to see that. It's still not the, the norm uh, for a man to be seen crying in the presence of others, which makes John Boehner so exceptional, right? Everybody talks about it. Uh, it's still not the norm for a woman to be turned to for advice on how to fix a malfunctioning car engine, although some women certainly can do that. And it's still not the norm for women to converse with other women about big league sports, although, of 
course, some do. We still expect most nurses to be women, most, not all, and we still expect most firefighters to be men. And when there are exceptions, we are intrigued by them and very interested in them. Change is very slow in our society in the deeply held assumption that when children are born, it is the mother who assumes primary responsibility for their rearing, for their health and for their welfare, especially when they're young. A continuing debate for educated middle-class women is where the motherhood responsibilities take precedence over a career. The media, the media have been particularly eager to write stories about women who opt out of the workforce for home and family. Career women, it is argued, are less likely to be happy wives and mothers, right? <laughs> More likely, in other words, to be the source of a rocky marriage. Typically absent from discussions of parenting is the role of fathers, husbands, and male partners. Good time for questions or comments. I just want to make a, a comment that it's good to see a lot of men in this crowd. I think this hope, I think it's going to take men to you know, at least one of society to make the change that you're pleading for us to do. It's a good sign. I, I assumed you were all here because you had to be, no? No. No? no? I had nothing to do today. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Glad you're here. Why yeah. is it that if a woman stays home, uh, that, she, that they, you know, people don't mean it, but they say, oh, she doesn't work? Right. <laughs> I, I can tell you that. Right, right, I know. Due to an injury, I was home with the kids. Yeah. And let me tell you, that was the <laughs> toughest job that I've ever done in my life. So. Yeah, that's why we have to be very careful when we talk about that, to talk about being uh, in minimum. paid employment. <laughs> <laughs> paid employment outside the home. When I said 61% are in the labor force. Paid employment. Now, of course, we all know that women work, and anyone at home works uh, who's doing the job of taking care of a house and rearing children. You we don't think. get the clock We out. know that. We know that. That's what. Comments? Questions? This time? All right. We'll move on. <clears throat> Thank you. Missing from discussions of conflicts between work and parenting is attention to social class and ethnicity. One writer suggests that an important set of beliefs held by young black girls derived from knowledge and experience of the lives of their mothers and other adult women in the black community is that motherhood and work are in fact intertwined. Black women are expected to balance the responsibilities of parenthood and paid employment and see maternal employment as being compatible with being a mother. Expected be both a mother and a member of the labor force, paid labor force. Just black Well, the data on black women, I don't, I'm just speaking on what we know. Uh, it could be other minorities of color. But I'm not sure that this would hold, let's say, for Asian American women. I'm not sure because we don't know that it holds for Latina women. I'm not sure. The data, the research has been done on black women who speak are speaking, and the woman that I'm citing here is a, is a black psychologist. So I'm only speaking for what we know. But it's very likely, because ethnicity is part and parcel of um, 
our identity and what is expected of us. So there's more to be said, but we do know this is true um, among black women. And it's not necessarily true of white middle class women, heterosexual women, yeah. Do you think it's more the case for black women because of the history of yeah. single parent families? Well, because of the history of slate going all the way back to slavery, <laughs> yeah. It's it and and struggle. I don't think it's just single motherhood. I think it's struggle uh, to make a living and social class and yeah. But it's it, you still find it even in middle class black families. Black women just don't. I mean, and you see it in the media. You see it in the newspaper. You don't see black women like white women writing these stories about the conflict between career and motherhood, you just don't. And that's part and parcel of the black culture about which you know we know what we know and don't know other things. So you just don't see it. The, all of the, the stuff in the, new, in, the, in the New York Times and other magazines about how hard it is to, to be a mother and a, and a career woman comes out of the mouths of white middle class women educated, but it does not come out of the mouths of even educated black middle, middle class women. Excuse me. Yeah. I'm a single mother who works 45 hours a week, um, never got a raise, and I did my job better than what my supervisor did. But if my daughter happened to be sick and I called out, I also got called out on the carpet because I took too much time. Oh, yeah. This is true for women working all kinds of jobs. Uh, one of my daughters is an attorney. Uh, she started out as an attorney. Her first job uh, was with a law firm. That's where you go. <laughs> you go to a law firm. She was a single mother. She had a, a daughter. Uh, her first experience uh, of that nature <laughs> Uh, was when uh, her daughter was young, young kid, little, little kid, uh, less than two or three, I think. Uh, uh, my granddaughter was homesick with a very bad case of the flu, and my daughter called her boss and said, I can't come in uh, for today and maybe not tomorrow, and uh, didn't fly. Could not, could not. She got... She got harassed. She got uh, she got uh, called on the carpet because you work here, you work by the hour, you do something. So what she finally did, of course, was decide that she could not work for a law firm, and she works for herself. <laughs> she also changed her whole focus, and she's now an immigration attorney, but she's not with a firm. She can't be and be a single mom because there's nobody. Basically, is that discrimination? Huh? Is that discrimination? Well, sure. <laughs> it's not taking into account the needs of uh, the primary parent. And the assumption is that um, uh, the job comes first and you make other kinds of arrangements, and it's your fault for not having a, a husband or a partner. Yeah, because we expect two parent, two parent families, and we're not about to easily make it uh, comfortable for people who do not fit into the, even though we know statistically that the two parent family is a myth, <laughs> right? It's gone, <laughs> but we still hold on to it in terms of what we provide and what we expect. Definitely a myth. I mean, the statistics show how the family has changed drastically. Yeah, so it's not it's not unusual, but you, a law firm, or at least her law firm, was not about to bend and get. I don't know. Maybe if she had been there thirty years, but then she wouldn't have been the mother of a young kid home alone with the flu. So. No, so you know it happened. It happens everywhere. Yes. Do you think that just just the fact that a, a woman could get pregnant that that's a big factor in companies 
you know, given specific slots to women, you know, in, in corporations and stuff like that. I, th I think, I think pregnancy and motherhood and the way in which we, as a society, <laughs> tend to deal with it yeah, is a huge factor. That's why I was talking about the fact that we still expect it to be the mother who is the primary caretaker. Right, so that's holding back women because that's, Absolutely. That's for, you know, even if a woman that has no intention to have it, it's there. I, I think it's a central, a central craziness. Absolutely. And I call it a craziness because we know that uh, conceiving a child takes <laughs> takes a man and a woman, or better put, takes a male and a female. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but once the baby's born, we have these crazy ideas, and and you know you read, you read, you read, you read, you read, you even read uh, things written by so-called mm, social progressives, and the father is barely mentioned as a solution to problems. Now you're 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 in the in this, in the personal situation of having been a primary caretaker, so you understand. But wouldn't it be nice if you had two people equally sharing the duties of parenthood? Well, now some some <coughs> some families in some families that's the it case. Does happen, but not it enough. does happen, not but enough. it's not the norm. It's not expected. I can tell you another personal story. We have time for personal yeah. stories? Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, when I was younger, uh, living in Kentucky, working in Kentucky, um, my husband, who's also a social psychologist, was teaching at the University of Kentucky in Lexington. I was working at another school in Frankfort, Kentucky, called, it's still called that, Kentucky State College. This was in the early 60s, mid 60s. At that time, uh, the University of Kentucky was all white. No black students allowed. It was the 60s early 60s, before the civil rights movement had made it succeeded in making a lot of changes. Kentucky State College was all black. It was the historically black college. Uh, a lot of these colleges had been set up during Reconstruction days, uh, right after Lincoln was assassinated. So there was Kentucky State, there was Morgan State, there was Ohio State. These were all for black students in the, in the Midwest and in, in the South. So I was teaching at Kentucky State College and uh, I was the only white person. That's just like the background. That's not the, the point. The point I'm getting to in a minute uh, is about what's expected of women and men. Anyway, we had our first child and Kentucky State College was a wonderful place for me to work because they were very um, attuned to what I would need to continue to work. And so I had a baby, this is my first baby, and we worked out a deal whereby I would teach two courses all in one day. Very unusual at that time, but Kentucky State was being very good to me. So I would come in in the morning and teach one class seminar style for three hours, have lunch, then I teach a second class seminar style for three hours. And these were undergraduates, but that was it. That was my, that right after I had the baby, that was my semester's um, uh, workload. Okay, who was gonna take care of the baby when I went to Kentucky State College in Frankfurt that one day a week. My husband, right? Because he could arrange his schedule. He was uh, teaching in, at, at another university. And that's what he did. And what do you think he got from his colleagues? Flack, grief, nasty comments about his character and the nature of our relationship. He was uh, harassed. 
for taking one day out of his work week, arranging his schedules in such a way so that he could stay home with the baby and I could go to work. But well, he was honest enough to tell them that's what he was doing. Well, no, he told them, yeah. I mean. Not that they had to know. Well, he was going to be home the same day, every Tuesday. <laughs> this semester, he was going to be home with his So yeah, it, now that was a long time ago. You got lucky, you got a real man. <laughs> <laughs> It was a long time ago. Whether it would happen today, uh, try it. <laughs> but you know, it's like we've all gone through that in one way or another. Yeah. I think that there's still the perception, like um, when she said that she was a single mom working, whatever. Even if she had been with someone, they still look at it as it's the woman's job. Right. Exactly. Even if there was a husband or whatever, right. he's not expected to do that right. because he's working. That's his job. That's all I do, and then come home and play with the kids. Right. So. It's That's it. That's the point. That's it. <laughs> Crazy, right? <laughs> Crazy. I have a um, question. I have a question. It's kind of wait, wait. We'll go, we'll go here first, and then we'll go back to you. I'm just going to add to that. In uh, being a father, uh, it's too bad that other men can't experience fatherhood because, to me, it's the, one of the best things that's ever happened. And, uh, I thought if more men would, more people, more men. Would realize that gift. I don't think there'd be as much flack. But there's, there, there are, you know, there are pressures put upon men, so that even though, let's say, you might want to, society does not make it easy for you to do that. That we're not. Our institutions are not set up to accommodate that. That's the sadness of the, that's why I call it crazy. Because obviously you're right, right? There's a lot of, ple a lot of pleasure in, uh, in being a father and, and uh, being a parent. As a male, uh, that was a very much of a growing experience. Yeah, yeah. So the pressures are there. Okay, now we're back to you. Uh, a white person, Condoleezza Rice, who managed to uh, she managed to uh, walk in the public eye and really got a lot of respect. Even got embraced by the foreign countries of, you know, Middle Eastern and yeah, so yeah. forth. Well, if you look at uh, Hillary Clinton, her authorities that minimize the penal crusade, but in Pakistan, they don't they kind of accept her as, as that public figure. And uh, what, what is your thought on that? Well, first of all, I don't know. I'm not sure I would agree that Condoleezza Rice got more respect than Hillary Clinton. We've had other women secretaries of state. We had yeah. Madeleine Albright, yeah, so remember? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure. I think maybe we have to wait till Clinton's tenure in office is over. Because remember, Condoleezza Rice got into a lot of trouble. There was a war. There was. Brought to my mind there were, there was an incident uh, in Pakistan where he had to actually say, well, I am. Right, speaker. right, right, right. Study my mind. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'd have to we'd have to read Condoleezza Rice's book or something. To see. I'm sure she has her stories. Oh, yeah. It, just, it wasn't uh, publicized so much yeah. as, you know, yeah. it seems deliberate sometimes that they go after certain yeah. people. Yeah, I mean, they're different in a lot of ways, so I think maybe uh, uh, Hillary would be more apt to put it out front if something was going on <laughs> that uh, she personally didn't like. But I don't know, that's, that's all speculation. No, it's a hard, it's hard to be in that position. Absolutely. Right, exactly. And any other? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, you're talking about that one person was single, oh yeah, single one other. You know how much you're discriminated, right? Can everybody hear her? No. Okay. See, that's why I wanted you all to come down front. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there, there are some people in the back. Okay, okay. Okay, well, you know, you know how she said that she was being discriminated because, because like, what was, uh, she should take care of her daughter, right? Yes. You said, oh, but can she do something about it? They go to take it to higher authority saying that I was discriminated because no matter what. I'm sure that 
that in like her first role is to be a mother, you know? And uh, the thing is, like, society I think, believes in that too. So even though society agrees with it, and, and like she's still being discriminated about it, can she do something about it? Depends upon I work her work condition. <laughs> I work for the government, and I'd still be in litigation if I went to them with my discrimination cases. So, um, so you can't do anything about it? And the answer, the answer is yes, sometimes, and no, because of the difficulties. And it uh, depends on the workplace. Some, some might have been a little. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not a good answer, yes or no. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, so moving, moving on. This is an absolutely wonderful group of people we have here today. I'm so excited. OK, so now I'm talking really about, or I was talking about, uh, how ethnicity and social class uh, get, in, get, get into it. All right, so I was talking about uh, pursuing a career and and um, and being a mother. Now let me say something about uh, a little bit more. I was just sort of getting into the issue of of ethnicity. Earlier feminist theory focused on women as women, uh, women, right? This position is now largely replaced, at least in word, if not in deed, with an appreciation of the significance of group membership so that women and men can be more authentically perceived within ethnic, social class, and other cultural uh, contexts, like for, for many, um, um, sexuality is an important cultural context. Gender inequality, which is our subject today, of course, is present in all spheres and all institutions. Family, economy, education, government, entertainment, and so on. But the particular features of patriarchy, which is a system of male dominance that we've been talking about, the particular features will vary with social class and with ethnicity. For example, women who are employed full-time outside the home now, in 2011, earn 75 cents for every dollar earned by a man. It's been like that for so long, and we keep saying it's changing. No. For African-American women, however, it's not 75 cents for every dollar earned by a man. It's 66 cents. And for Latinas, it's 55 cents. <coughs> and as women and men grow older, the difference in their earnings increases. So age, age becomes a factor as well. It may or may not surprise you to learn that gender inequality, especially along these economic lines, gender inequality in the United States is greater than in any other industrialized country in the world. And there are so many measures Go and find worldwide measures of inequality. Doesn't matter what the measure is, we're down. Not at the bottom of all countries, but industrialized. Bottom of all industrialized countries. When you're thinking about low-income women, or considering the situation of low-income women, you're, you're, you've got to take into consideration the extra challenges that are faced by low-income women related to childcare, related to surviving in dangerous neighborhoods, related to having to move frequently, related to job instability, related to discrimination, and so on and so forth. All right, we've already had some questions in this area, so maybe I should move on so that some of you have to leave at 
in a few minutes I can do that. All right, to maintain that gender provides differential cultural experiences for girls, women, and boys, men is not the same as subscribing to myths about sex differences, which we were talking about before. Such generalizations are common and predominant in popular discussions, images, and understanding of gender. But empirical searches for, for gender differences do not always find them. Even though the slightest hint of a study that uncovers gender sex differences is highlighted in the media. Big headlines, blah, 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 women and men are, but the, the, the good detailed uh, studies just don't find them. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, a review of more than 40 years of research on sex differences in aptitude for mathematics and science, always top billing, concluded that persons of both genders share the same cognitive capacities and are equally talented. Similarly, an analysis of test, test scores from over 7 million students in the United States in grades 2 through 11 failed to find evidence of a significant gender difference in math performance that favored boys. Now, the same is true of, uh, in the verbal area where women are supposed to be better um, uh, than men. Mm, the data just simply does not support that. Little statistical support for overall differences between women and men in talkativeness, affiliative speech, and assertive speech. In some conditions, you do find uh, a difference, like when it's a mixed gender situation, uh, uh, you may find that men talk more than women, but that's about it. <laughs> that's the main finding in a lot of research. There is so much research in this area. So the search for sex differences continues, and any that are find, found excuse me, quickly become headlined. Uh, it surprises some people and shocks other people that some older differences that we expect are disappearing. Um, uh, data from large-scale studies in the United States find little difference between teenage girls and boys in not the best of things, but little difference in smoking, little difference in drug use, a little difference in consumption of alcohol, little difference in car accidents. I mean, all of these things, <laughs> unfortunately, but it's not a gender phenomenon anymore in contemporary uh, the, the United States. 